Let me close the door here. My name is Steve Clemens. I'm director of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. Uh, we're going to have more people come in. Uh, this is an odd time for us to have an event. We have about 100 folks watching online right now, so hello, uh, Washington Note viewers, where most of them are, but some of them are on the New America website as well. Uh, who would have thought on a very hot day in D.C. you could um, have a debate about liberal internationalism with four uh, academics, as great as these academics are, uh, and generate a, a decent crowd. There, there supposedly will be about 70 people here uh, this evening on almost no notice. And Charlie Kupchin uh, made me violate one of my, my rules that I recently uh, have embraced in marketing, which is I, I typically don't put any text describing what we're doing, just a headline or title. Uh, and Charlie insisted on about three paragraphs, and yet you're still here. So you must actually be interested in the subject. <clears throat> um, I've been uh, uh, acquainted with all of the, the folks that are speaking. I should mention that John Eikenberry, who initiated today's program, is on the train and will be walking in mid-program uh, coming down. Uh, from, from the Northeast, uh, so he will be here with us. But the subject of, of what is happening with the sort of intellectual architecture of the American foreign policy schools has, has long intrigued me, and I know many of the people in the room. Charlie Kupchin and Peter Trubowitz have written a provocative article uh, that's based on other work as well that they've done. I've been uh, wrestling with them for a while called Dead Center. Uh, the Demise of Liberal Internationalism in the United States. This ran in International Security Magazine uh, this past year, has gotten a lot of attention, uh, and, and I think it's been, they've been ha engaging in a number of debates. And what they, with, with, I'll let them describe what they're basically arguing, but to some degree, they think that for a lot of structural reasons, the um, liberal internationalism as a school of thought is basically dead. And I've been asked not to pitch them too ferociously at their team, but I can't help them because that is the, fundamentally the bottom line of their piece, and I think it's hard to avoid it, even though I think they lament uh, the passing. Uh, John Eikenberry and David Dudney are going to provide uh, a con contrasting view, and I think argue that, that uh, uh, one, they're wrong, uh, and two, that there's, there's much yet uh, in, the, in the life of liberal internationalism in the United States. But let me share just a couple of, of, of my own thoughts uh, before introducing Charlie Kupchin to take the helm. One is, I found it interesting in the debates today, particularly as we saw the neoconservative movement, a movement um, which has long been part of the American foreign policy establishment and debates, really gain ground, uh, really uh, through both, I think, excellent organization uh, by, by folks like Bill Kristol and his, his antecedents, nonetheless, uh, help cultivate a new generation of thinkers, like-minded people, building fabrics of relationship and perspective, working across, uh, frankly, both sides of the aisle, mostly Republicans, but certainly some Democrats as well, uh, on an agenda that, that <coughs> adopted a militant, uh, almost messianic, values-based uh, interventionism. Um, and in that, in that success they had, when you look at it and say, how did that happen? It's sort of like how did, if you were to imagine in German politics, how did the Green Party, for instance, become chancellor, which is essentially what happened. They'd long been involved with the foreign policy establishment, but they sort of moved up to the top fast. Uh, in part, I think, in my view, it was the, a sleepiness, a laziness, and inertia in the dominant schools, which were liberal internationalism and realism, which used to fight it out all the time, but today, given what we've seen, look extraordinarily close and tied together. In fact, I think it's my biggest critique of your papers, I think you morph them together. Um, but we also in the, see in the Democratic Party, and I would love them to address this uh, or anticipate the question later, is that in the Democratic Party, in my view, we have a left form of neoconservatism, a, 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 a more strident liberal interventionism, that is unmoored or not moored to the construct you've said. And to some degree, the liberal internationalists and realist schools are dying or have slipped in both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, uh, and that's interesting to, to get into. Let me tell you just a little bit about our four speakers. Charlie Kupchin is Senior Fellow uh, for European Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and a Professor of International Affairs at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Uh, he's author of the must-read End of the American Era, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Geopolitics of the 21st Century. He wrote this in 2002, um, and uh, I, one of my favorite lines from Charlie Kupchin is he had no I idea that George Bush, uh, George Bush could speed up history 
country so quickly uh, uh, to, to validate his findings. Peter Trubowitz is Associate Professor of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he's written for a wide variety of publications, International Security, Foreign Affairs, uh, and has most recently published a book entitled Defining the National Interest, Conflict, and Change in American Foreign Policy. Daniel Dudney is Associate Professor of International Relations and Political Theory at Johns Hopkins University uh, here near Baltimore. Uh, he's the author of several articles in a book, Bounding Power, Republican Security Theory from the Polis to the Global Village. Uh, so we will look, uh, which I guess Foreign Affairs Magazine uh, termed brilliant. Uh, in quotes. John Eikenberry, who will be joining us shortly, but we'll introduce him now, is the Albert Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at, w at Princeton University and, of course, uh, teaches it well at the Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, Center there, along with a New America board member, Anne-Marie Slaughter. Uh, he's written many books uh, recently, After Victory, Institutions, Strategic Restraint, and the Rebuilding of Order After Major Wars on State Power in the World Economy. Um, he, along with Anne-Marie Slaughter and some others, um, have also been principal uh, instigators in the discussion of a concert of democracies, which I hope we'll get into and discuss uh, as well, that he'll bring up. And um, I, I do want to give John Eikenberry and Charlie uh, special thanks for initiating uh, today's program and suggesting it and trying to get everyone from their various corners here in town to make it what happen. So please give a uh, uh, welcome hand to Charlie Kupchin, who will take us uh, further at this point. Charlie? And I'm going to sit in John Eikenberry's place until he shows up. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, uh, for the warm introduction and also for pulling this uh, event together uh, in relatively short notice. Actually, for you, it was seven years in advance. Yeah. You did it on Friday rather than ten minutes before the event. But uh, nonetheless, uh, thanks for gathering us all together. What I want to do is, is, is kind of lay the foundation for the conversation we're going to have today and introduce the topic. Peter is then going to summarize the guts, the analytic guts of our paper, and, and then I'm going to come back and, and share with you just a few minutes of policy conclusions, and then we're going to turn it over to, to Dan and John uh, to, to uh, sort of bounce off our ideas. And, and I thought one of the, the best ways to start would be to, uh, to share with you what I think we're not disagreeing about, uh, in the sense that all four of us, or five of us, I'll include uh, uh, Steve in this, even though uh, he's not technically a member of the panel, uh, are, are liberal internationalists. Uh, I think that if you, if you asked us what policies in an ideal world would you like to see the McCain administration or the Obama administration pursue, there wouldn't be a huge disagreement among us. Uh, and in that sense, uh, we, we don't fundamentally differ in terms of the prescription, what we would like for America, what we think the world needs from America. Where I think the big differences lie are in the diagnosis, in our assessment of the political environment in which American grand strategy must now be formulated. And the core of our argument is that the liberal internationalist compact, a compact between the projection of American power and the pursuit of partnership with other countries, that compact, which was essentially put together by Roosevelt and then embraced from one president to the next through Clinton, has come undone. And it's come undone in part for geopolitical reasons and in part for domestic reasons. And Peter's going to talk about both sides of that equation. But what it means is that any president who attempts to resuscitate the liberal internationalist compact is go the liberal internationalist compact is going to have a very difficult time doing so. Because neither the international nor the domestic environment are as conducive to the practice of that kind of grand strategy as they used to be. And I think on balance, Dan and John are going to focus more on the international side of the equation, and Peter and I are going to focus more on the domestic side. I think we both believe that 
the domestic and the international are important. But on balance, if pressed, I think we'd say that domestic politics is doing more of the work than is the international environment. And we come to that conclusion in part because there are other periods in history in which the United States should have pursued liberal internationalism but did not. Why, after the close of World War I, when liberal internationalism was on offer in the form of the League of Nations, <coughs> did Wilson go down in flames and the United States defect? Was it because the world in 1919 was so different from the world in 1945? We don't think so. We think that the difference was the domestic landscape and the partisanship of the Wilson period versus the bipartisanship of the Roosevelt period. In the 1930s, there was a clear and present threat to the United States. But the US remained isolationist rather than embracing the projection of power as it did after Pearl Harbor, not because the world didn't necessitate American engagement, but because the domestic politics weren't there to support it. And that's why in the end of the day, when push comes to shove, we think that the domestic impediments to liberal internationalism are more potent today than are the international blockages. Let me just say one other thing by way of introduction, and then Peter is going to sort of dive into the, to the analytics. Uh, as I mentioned, we define liberal internationalism as a compact between power and partnership. The United States projects power abroad, but it does so through international institutions, through multilateralism, and we'd also throw in a third plank of the liberal internationalist agenda, and that is economic openness. And we submit that that package of ideas, power, partnership, and economic openness, required bipartisanship, that bipartisanship and liberal internationalism go hand in hand. And we feel that that's uh, critical in part because if you go back to American foreign policy pre Pearl Harbor, you will see an American grand strategy that was all over the map precisely because there was no bipartisan consensus. Teddy Roosevelt came into office and he was the president of power. That didn't go so well, conquered the Philippines and soon didn't feel like digesting empire. Then Woodrow Wilson comes along, and he's the president of partnership. But as I just mentioned, the Senate would have none of it, rejecting the League of Nations. And then these two camps, the camp of power and the camp of partnership, effecto veto effectively vetoed each other. And we had the lowest common denominator from the 20s until Pearl Harbor, which is nothing. We couldn't agree on either power or partnership, so we simply retreated into isolationism. Bipartisanship was central to breaking that logjam. And it was, it was critical to the onset of liberal internationalism, we submit, for three main reasons. One, prior to Roosevelt and the 1940s, it was too dangerous to stick your neck out for power and partnership because there were too many isolationists and unilateralists <laughs> who would cut your head off. And bipartisanship induced people to hold their fire. Second, I think people often forget that even though the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief, liberal internationalism requires the acquiescence of the Senate. And that's because liberal internationalism involves treaties. It involves pacts. And to get NATO or to get the UN or to get any major international treaty through Congress, you need two-thirds of the Senate. You can't do it with one party. You need both. And finally, bipartisanship was central to the story that Peter's about to tell because it meant that a grand strategy of liberal internationalism would outlast Roosevelt. It meant that there was bipartisan continuity to the grand strategy that emerged under his watch and not just a fleeting flirtation with liberal internationalism that was to die as soon as Roosevelt and those around him were no longer in office. So that's the setup. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. Charlie. Peter Trubowitz. 
Great. Well, Steve, thanks very much for putting this together. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Charlie mentioned, um, one of the things that we argue in the piece is that liberal internationalism's rise was contingent on a form or a pattern of political behavior in the United States, which was very unusual, and that's bipartisanship. Bipartisanship is not the norm in American politics. It's the exception. If you go back, you look at a kind of American history, look at voting patterns, let's say, in the Congress for, you know, since the, um, since the founding, um, bipartisanship is very rare, and it's very, very difficult to sustain. And so one of the things that makes the period running from um, the 1940s um, uh, up into the 1990s um, striking is how long bipartisanship was sustained. And to know why or to be able to kind of understand what made it sustainable, you really need to know something about, that's what we argue in the piece, something about the structural conditions that followed or that were in place following World War II. There are a lot of different factors, and we catalog them, that contributed to liberal internationalism's rise in the, in, in the 1940s and its subsequent articulation and extension uh, under Republican as well as Democratic administrations. But there are really two big, at least this is what we argue, we try to boil the thing down, there were two big structural considerations. One of them was international. I want to say something about that. Um, and the other was domestic. Um, on the international side, what we, we argue in the piece is that the presence of a, a geopolitical rival, namely the Soviet Union, um, uh, was, um, was essential in the sense that what it did was it gave Republicans and Democrats politics, politicians of all persuasions, really, a powerful political incentive to hew to the center, um, to look for ways to minimize differences between themselves uh, and their political opponents, and to protect themselves from the very real risk of a development or a, an event that the public might plausibly judge a strategic failure, losing a country uh, to communism on their watch, allowing the Soviets or the Chinese to expand their, their territorial power. Um, put another way, what politicians very early on came to, to realize is that their hold on power and their party's hold on power depended on managing geopolitics in a way that was not true just a couple of decades earlier. And so what became, and what also became evident to America's leaders, and FDR was really the first one to appreciate this, is that military power alone could not solve their political problem, that is to guarantee the country's security. That partners were needed as well, um, uh, if only after World War II, to provide staging areas uh, in order to project American power over the geographic expanses that separated the United States from geopolitical challengers in Eurasia. Um, among other things, this meant investing in both power and cooperation. <coughs> and to be sure, there were sharp disagreements from time to time, let's say, over the proper mix of nuclear and conventional forces. And bipartisan agreement and the need for power plus partnership or power plus institutions did not mean that partisanship never reared its head. Partisan passions sometimes flared um, as they did over the Korean War, but they were always short-lived. Even the Vietnam War, which deeply divided the United States, did not split the country along stark partisan lines, certainly not the way the Iraq War has. So in short, for good and sometimes ill, the Cold War, or bipolarity, had a kind of dampening effect or a disciplining effect on America's politics. It gave Democrats and Republicans alike a political stake in liberal internationalism. 
And this is one of the things that we argue that's really changed. What the end of the Cold War did was reintroduce a degree of political latitude, what I like to call geopolitical slack in the country's politics that it really had not experienced since the interwar years. And it's one of the reasons that Bill Clinton could afford to try to keep foreign policy on the back burner and also why George Bush could pay multilateralism short shrift in trying to exploit unipolarity. So part of the story that we tell in the mechanics of Dead Center is about how these political incentives changed and why September 11th has not exercised the same kind of disciplining effect on America's politics. But the story, as Charlie suggested, is not simply a tale about how geopolitics shaped America's domestic politics, it's also the reverse. That is, how changes in America's political landscape weakened the political incentives that politicians on, that have weakened the political incentives that politicians on both sides of the aisle have to invest their own political capital in liberal internationalism. What we contend is that liberal internationalism's rise was also contingent on a particular alignment of party and regional interests that made it possible for Democrats and Republicans to agree over foreign policy. And much of this had to do with the party's overlap um, uh, in, um, in their regional bases, especially in the Northeast. Um, it also reflected the fact that the New Deal party system was less regionally polarized than earlier party systems and that is true as well today. During the 1930s, the Democratic Party basically, which was long based in the South, picked the Republicans' lock on the urban Northeast. And what we argue is that in doing so, they created an incentive for, bi an opportunity really, for bipart uh, bipartisanship in foreign policy. Now, I don't have the time to develop the idea, but the essential point is that because core elements of both the Democratic and Republican Party stood to benefit politically as well as economically from a commitment to maintain order, stability, and openness on the Eurasian landmass, the representatives in Washington had an additional incentive to invest in liberal internationalism. In short, liberal internationalism became America's grand strategy because it was politically desirable and politically feasible. And this, we argue, is increasingly less the case. Well, the trends we discussed began before the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Empire. That collapse accelerated things by making the commitment to power plus partnership less politically imperative, less imperative geopolitically, and thus less compelling domestically. And as we suggest, this was already clear on Clinton's watch even though it has proved to be much more costly on Bush's. Meanwhile, the transformation of what was a depolarized, regionally depolarized party system, that is the New Deal party system, um, into today's polarized red versus blue landscape, has basically made the kind of bipartisanship that was, and the centrism that was the lifeblood of liberal internationalism basically less politically attractive for politicians on both sides of the aisle to invest in. And so the bottom line is that neither Republicans nor Democratic partisans now support the kind of liberal internationalism that once guided U.S. foreign policy. It is not hard to find Democrats. If you look at polls, and we catalog, we go through polling data, we go through roll call data in the Congress, and we look at voting records, it is not hard to find Democrats who think America should rely more on international institutions and in multilateralism that should invest heavily in partnership, international partnership. And it's also not hard to find Republicans who want to invest in national power. What is increasingly hard to find out there are Democrats and Republicans who want to invest in both, and that's really the bottom line point in the piece, that what has happened is that the core 
partisans of the two parties have gravitated to one side of the liberal internationalist compact, either power or partnership. And that is what distinguishes this period so much from kind of the height or, you know, the golden era of liberal internationalism where substantial parts of both parties, where Republican and Democratic partisans alike came together and agreed on power plus partnership. So it's a very depressing story at one level because we're basically talking about the kind of a polarization that, you know, has to, a kind of structural constraint domestically on U.S. foreign policy going forward. And so the question is, is how do you manage U.S. foreign policy and how do you maintain a commitment to liberal internationalism when the domestic conditions, really the kind of robustness, the kind of robust bipartisanship that once existed no longer does. And in, not in this piece, but in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in a, another piece that appeared in Foreign Affairs, we cataloged a number of steps that we thought the next administration could consider in trying to kind of breathe some life back into this. And Charlie is going to kind of close with those comments. Just to <clears throat> illustrate what Peter was talking about, I ask you to <clears throat> kind of take a snapshot of America after World War II and a snapshot of where we are today. Right? After World War II, we had just been victorious. We were enjoying a post-war boom. The Industrial Revolution was taking off, creating a mixing bowl, mixing classes and races. The APSA, the American Political Science Association, was so worried about the absence of ideological division between Republicans and Democrats that they formed a task force. What year was that? I think it was 1950. It was a very famous task force. 52. 52. Uh, uh, you know, saying, hey, we need a little, a little life in our political system. Today, we've got two wars going on. Neither of them is going particularly well. Our economy seems to be going south, by the, uh, deeper in south by the day. Income inequality, rather than diminishing as it did during the post-war boom, is growing. Instead of having a new alliance between the North and South, because Democrats had moved from the North to the South and built a North-South alliance for the first time in American history on foreign policy, we are seeing a country that is becoming more regionally polarized. And I simply ask you to imagine whether today, if President McCain or President Obama put on offer what Roosevelt and Truman and those after him put on offer, the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, GATT, NATO, CETO, CENTO, would they make it through the U.S. Senate today? I have my doubts. I'd go so far as to say no. And it would generally be the Republican Party that would block it. I simply don't know after Hegel leaves and Luger retires, and he'll do so sometime soon, where you would get Republican votes for major international institutions and multilateralism. At the same time, I think the Democratic Party is backing away from another important plank of the liberal internationalist agenda, and that is free trade. I would guess that if the Democrats have the White House and the Democrats have both houses of Congress, there's not going to be a lot of enthusiasm for Doha. We've already seen Colombia and, and South Korea free trade deals stall. And my, my sense is this is not just campaign politics, that there is a secular change going on in the country, the deindustrialization of the heartland, that is going to make it much more difficult for politicians in general, but Democrats in particular, to remain partners with Republicans on the question of economic openness. 
So as, as we see different parts of the political landscape defect from different parts of the liberal internationalist agenda, it's hard to say where this bipartisan center is going to come from. Now, it's true that McCain and Obama are both centrist candidates to some extent, and they're both now tacking to the center now that the primaries are over. And it may well be that Obama does a good job of appealing to centrist voters and winning over independents and stealing some of the traditional Republican constituency. And he may well win in a landslide. But I think one that has to say, what's America going to be like on day number two in the Oval Office? It's going to be a very polarized country. There was an article in yesterday's Times that simply kind of chronicled where we are in terms of, of polarization. Uh, and in many of the different aspects of foreign <coughs> policy that we looked at in this piece, Democrats and Republicans are heading in opposite directions. The final comment, where do we go from here? What's our policy prescription? And I'll just take one minute here and we can talk more about it in the Q&A. Uh, our view is that American foreign policy has become insolvent, politically insolvent, because of the collapse of the bipartisan center. And if there is going to be a new politically solvent grand strategy, it's going to be one that is more selective and more judicious. Less is more. We would rather see the United States aim for a grand strategy that's less ambitious but politically sustainable than to shoot for one that is what it was, let's say, at the height of the Cold War, the liberal internationalism in the, 19, in the 1990s, and have the president look over his shoulder and find that there is no one there standing behind him. And so we see the U.S. as a country that should look to others to share more burdens, the EU, the ASEAN, GCC, other, other international organizations. We think that engagement of adversaries is critical. And indeed, this whole argument between McCain and Obama about whether to engage adversaries, I think, is laughable. I mean, history answers that question. You don't talk, you don't fix problems. Pragmatic partnerships rather than highfalutin, ambitious, grand designs, Peter and I would say, let's work with anybody who's going to work with us and put ideas like a League of Democracies on the back burner. And finally, we think that it's going to take a new type of domestic strategy to build a coalition for this new grand strategy, looking for specific alliances across the political spectrum, because those alliances will not be there naturally like they used to be. Environmentalists on the left with ev evangelicals on the right behind climate change. Pro-immigration on the left with big business to get immigration reform. Democrats who support institutions for principled reasons with Republicans who might be willing to sign off on them because it lightens the load of foreign policy. But our main message is it's not like in that movie field of dreams, build the ballpark and they will come. If we build the liberal internationalist ballpark today, they will not come. We may have to go out there in trucks and put them in the trucks and drive them to the ballpark and we'll still only get half of the stadium full. So in other words, we have our, our work uh, cut out for us. We don't abandon the liberal internationalist agenda. We just think if we're going to head in that direction, it's going to have to be along a different route than it has been for the last 60 years, and it's going to be very, very difficult politically. Okay. Lots of stuff there. I've just, um, before Daniel comes up, I have a note from uh, uh, those who've been in touch with John Eikenberry that he's hoping to be here 6.30, 6.45. I guess in hot weather, uh, train tracks melt or something. But uh, he was at BWI. He's on his way. So Daniel, uh, you're up next. Well, I was actually going to be the second of the two uh, on our side of this debate. And rather than summarize what John was going to say, I'll 
uh, say what I was going to say. When I was asked to uh, talk for 10 minutes about uh, liberal internationalism, I was reminded of a story about Woodrow Wilson, who was a big speech maker. And someone said to him, President Wilson, you give all these speeches. Uh, how long does it take you to get ready for them? And he paused and he thought and he said, well, if you want an hour long speech, I'm ready right now. But if you want 10 minutes, that'll take some time. Uh, this is a big topic, and uh, what I want to do is to make a few general points and then hone in on the overall uh, situation with one particular part of the agenda. Now, why has liberal internationalism been significant in American life historically? The fundamental reason is because it has been a problem-solving or orientation. Liberal internationalism is something that the United States has embraced because it solves significant real problems. And the position that John and I are arguing on behalf of today is that liberal internationalism is as relevant as ever with a somewhat different set of problems. The basic logic underlying it is still essentially the same and that it is the, in addressing the problems that we generate the uh, bipartisan solutions politically that are so necessary. Now, Peter and uh, Charlie have told us that liberal internationalism depended upon a bipartisan political basis. Uh, our view is that when we, when we are confronted with a major problem, then we get bipartisan consensus. Why was there bipartisan consensus after the Second World War? Well, it was essentially for two reasons. One is we had just had the very recent demonstration effect of the catastrophic consequences of the Great Depression, the collapse of the international order, the rise of fascist states, and because we faced an imminent peril in the form of the Soviet Union. It focused people's minds. It was the problem that created the consensus, not the consensus that created the ability to address the problem. Now, when we look at the agenda of international liberalism today, uh, it's very, very fragmented. Uh, we all know what it is, arms control, global warming, the international criminal court. But these are ideas that are disconnected from one another. They lack an overarching vision. And they're also disconnected from the fundamental discourses and traditions of the United States. They have this Washington policy air. Uh, they do not sit at the high table of conversation about American grand strategy. The whole is less than the sum of the parts. And so part of the agenda, uh, conceptually and intellectually, to respond to the challenge that Steve uh, posed at the beginning for liberal internationalism, is to connect the liberal internationalist agenda to fundamental American needs and purposes. Now, what I'm going to do is focus uh, on what I take to be uh, the historically most central problem, uh, the relationship between security and liberty. And I'm going to lay out uh, an interpretation of the origins and character and trajectory of American liberal internationalism as a project to preserve political liberty in the United States in changing circumstances. And then I'm going to suggest that this basic trajectory, this basic design solution set that we have been working with for 200 years is now more relevant than ever in an era of weapons of mass destruction proliferation. Now, we all know the non-proliferation treaty is in a state of decay. The United States has abandoned uh, arms control at this point. This is the first juncture in American history since the beginning of the nuclear age when the United States has not either been seeking or in negotiations for reductions in nuclear weapons. We seem to have abandoned this. I want to take this security topic within our portfolio of the global uh, liberal agenda and make the case for its renewed centrality and also for its connectivity to the core of the American project. Yeah, and you'll just make the case near the mic. Near the mic, okay. Just for the folks, the 100 folks on the internet. Okay. 
Uh, good. Uh, I think I can do that. I do like to weave around. Um, <laughs> we commonly think uh, that liberal internationalism is something that originated in the late 19th or early 20th century. Uh, this is actually uh, an interpretation that, say, Walter Russell Mead has recently given us. Wilsonianism uh, was this project of peace was good for humanitarian betterment and trade was good for utilitarian advantage and improvement in wealth. Uh, in actuality, uh, the origins of liberal internationalism are in the American founding itself. And the logic of American internationalism is actually Madisonian in its fundamental notions. The purpose is to preserve limited government and thus political liberty in the United States. Now, of course, originally we didn't use the language of liberal internationalism to refer to this agenda. It was originally unionism or the union. And we can see the fundamental logic of liberal internationalism articulated very clearly in the core first 14 or so of the Federalist Papers. We have these 13 units, these 13 fragile republics, and the argument that Hamilton makes with extreme clarity is that if these 13 units do not leave the anarchy that they have among themselves, if they do not establish a perpetual and firm union, then there's going to be wars and rivalries between these republics, and that will produce internal militarism, which will eventually destroy the Republican limited government. So the logic of establishing the United States was to get out of anarchy among these 13 <coughs> units in order to preserve liberty at the unit level. That's the fundamental project. It's political liberty from the foundation up. Now, of course, at the time of the American founding, and subsequently, and even today, it was recognized that the viability of this novel form of limited government, remember the United States was an experiment. The United States was something new, a new order of the ages, radically different than the regimes which had preceded it. It was understood that the viability of this project was significantly dependent upon this geographic uh, accident, this geographic circumstance of the Atlantic Ocean, providing this moat, providing this barrier uh, that protected the uh, nascent United States from the predatory uh, great powers of Europe. It is in the late 19th century that this original happy situation began to deteriorate, and it is in this situation in the late 19th century that we begin to get the articulation of what we now know as liberal internationalism. The crucial development, of course, was the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, transportation, communication, destructive technology shrank the world. The United States was now thrown into an increasingly interactive global state system with the same set of predatory power, some of which were modernizing and even more threatening than before. And it was at this juncture, at this cusp of globalization with regard to security, that liberal internationalism was articulated, not as a project of utilitarianism or humanitarianism, but rather as a regime conservative project. This is something that we have tended to forget. The logic that Wilson laid out, make the world safe for democracy. The logic was very simple, that if the United States did not do two things, we were going to lose limited government constitutionalism in the United States. We might be able to survive as an independent state, but we would no longer be a free state unless we did two things. First, we had to uh, transform the other units in the system, from despotisms, various types of hierarchies, into some form of a limited and constitutional government. Of course, democracy promotion is the great, great grandson of this insight. And of course, the success of this agenda in the middle years of the 20th century, in the wake of the Second World War, was an important advance for the survival of political freedom, not just in this country, but in the planet more generally. Change the other units. The other part of the agenda was to alter the system. If we stayed in anarchy with other states, there would tend to be rivalries which would tend to lead to war, which would uh, lead to domestic militarism. 
And the solution there was to abridge anarchy with some sort of union-like arrangement, international law, international organizations, and what was later called regimes. Now note that this project of liberal internationalism is regime conservative. It's attempting to preserve limited government constitutionalism and political freedom in the United States. And throughout this period, American grand strategy is haunted not simply by aggressive states that might overrun us. We're big enough in all likelihood to fend them off. But it's also haunted by the vision, the specter of the garrison state. The proposition that if the United States stayed in an anarchic system with, with such polities as Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan or the Soviet Union, we would eventually become like them. We would have to mobilize sufficient state power over such an extended period of time that limited government constitutionalism would be lost. This was a fundamental motivating logic that helped bring Americans together on this project. Now note that we were by necessity forced into uh, great power balancing. We had to prevent Eurasia from falling into the hands of one state. But the United States was never a regular great power, was never a normal great power as the realists continued to tell us we should be. The United States had to do that. We were relatively successful in doing it. But we always had this second agenda, this liberal international agenda that cut to the core of what our project of political liberty was about. Now, as we come into the second half of the 20th century, the specter of the garrison state receded. No one talks about this anymore, right? Why did this happen? Why did the garrison state as a problem go away? for two reasons. First of all, because of relative American success. We had all these allies now uh, who could provide armies, who could provide military expenditures, reducing the burden on the United States. The second reason that is often overlooked for the garrison states receding as a problem is because of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons made it possible for the United States to balance against the Soviet Union without sustaining a World War II level of mobilization. In the wake of the Second World War, before nuclear weapons were fully understood and deployed, the United States started to make plans about how we would defend Western Europe from the Soviet Union with simply conventional weapons. And the, it was a very bleak prognosis. We were going to have to sustain a military mobilization of roughly half to two-thirds of what we had during the Second World War. We had 12 million men in uniform. In 1944, we had half the GDP devoted to military expenditures. We were going to have to make a burden of that type of magnitude essentially indefinitely. Now, nuclear weapons made that unnecessary. Nuclear weapons provided a breathing space for constitutional democracy. Now, the effects of nuclear weapons are complicated because they also hollowed democracy in a certain way. We have a kind of nuclear despotism, a nuclear monarchy. The president has this sole authority not simply to make war but to catastrophically end civilization. Democracy has been short-circuited. But in a more profound way, the structure of the American regime was preserved by nuclear weapons. Now, this brings us to the contemporary period. The threat that we face today is of weapons of mass destruction in the hands of non-state actors. The nuclear revolution didn't occur in 1945, and we've been adapting to it ever since. The nuclear revolution is part of an ongoing cascade in the increasing potency and increasing miniaturability of increasingly powerful violence capabilities. We are starting to pass over a threshold when the volume of fissile material, to say nothing of biological weapons, is on a global basis becoming so large that we have to prudently assume that a weapon of mass destruction attack on the United States is not a question of weather, but a question of when.
Now, this is something, of course, that's been much talked about after 9-11. And 9-11, we should see not as a problem with terrorism in general that launches on some general war against anyone who would use any kind of terrorism, but rather, we should see 9-11 as a kind of warning, as a bolt of lightning on a dark night that very briefly illuminates a very ominous new landscape. And this ominous new landscape is leakage, the leakage of weapons of mass destruction capability into the hands of non-state actors. Now, it is at this juncture, of course, that we are faced with the prospect not of the destruction of the United States, right? This is not going to be like a full nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union that was going to kill 180 million people or so in a day. We might lose a couple of major cities. We'll survive, but we're going to be faced with a dramatic domestic regime transformation. 9-11 gives us the Patriot Act and the Department of Homeland Security and all this surveillance and so forth. 9-11 to the third or fourth or fifth power is going to give us the Patriot Act to the third or fourth or fifth power. We're talking about a new version of the garrison state, much more nimble, right, a more virtual garrison state, equipped with information technologies that would have been the envy of their totalitarian predecessors. But the same logic that applied in the middle years of the 20th century that led us to global internationalism today is true even to a larger degree. That is to say we face a regime destructive international environment and unless we, through a program of liberal internationalism, in this case particularly arms control, alter this international environment, domestic liberty is going to be in severe jeopardy. Now we all know what we have to do here. Uh, fissile material uh, has to be comprehensively shrunk and contained. There is approximately enough plutonium, not counting enriched uranium, and not counting plutonium which is part of the nuclear power cycle, but just plutonium which has been uh, reprocessed and separated for nuclear weapons use to produce approximately 400,000 nuclear weapons. Right? Now, I'm, I'm a strong believer in the competence of government. I believe that we actually can have government programs that are 99.5, maybe even 99.9% .9 effective. That's still going to leave a lot of plutonium leaking out. And the competence of states you know, it is not necessarily going to be uniformly high. Uh, we are sitting at the edge of a disaster that we have not wrapped our minds around here. And the solution set to it is not unilateral preemption, right, but is rather a full bore pursuit of what was the American agenda from the very beginning of the Cold War which is to say some form of shrinkage and some form of comprehensive containment. This is to say that we have the nuclear arms control agenda, the non-proliferation treaty, the United States is a signatory to it, and we have committed in this treaty to get rid of all of our nuclear weapons, eventually, eventually, eventually. Who talks about that seriously uh, as, as a policy proposal? Some people do, but it's at the edge and it's not connected to this fundamental regime conservative agenda. So I suggest uh, in conclusion, I'm sure I've gone far over my time, haven't I? But it's been dramatic. Well, thank you. Uh, that uh, the liberal internationalist agenda uh, is not something which is ancillary to the American project. It's not something which is new to the American project. It sits right at the core of the logic of our polity. And liberal internationalism has been successful politically because it's been vital uh, for solving basic American needs. The liberal internationalism of our grandparents was an important accomplishment that the world in which we live would be radically different without. But liberal internationalism today has to continue to innovate. It has to be responsive to the fundamental issues that we face now. Now, I've talked about one of these issues, nuclear proliferation. The full conversation, of course, would look at the spectrum of these uh, items, particularly global warming would be next on my list. I actually had all that written out, but I don't have time for that, obviously. <laughs> so in conclusion, 
liberal internationalism is as vital as ever, and liberal internationalism's, uh, upon liberal internationalism's success, in the future, as in the past, hinges fundamental American values. Daniel, thank you very much. You know, I, uh, in my past, have uh, uh, spent some time with people like Bill Joy, uh, who wrote the uh, famous uh, piece for Wired magazine called Why the Future Doesn't Need, Need Us, which was sort of how nanotechnology and microprocessing and, and, and essentially nuclear stuff, WMDs, were going to get us. Uh, Michael Crichton is another person. They were all tall, and I was always as scared of, of them uh, as I now am of you, Daniel. Um, uh, and I, I found it very interesting listening to your perspective because the high fear scenario you lay out is awfully similar in many ways to the high fear scenario that Dick Cheney loves to talk about, maybe not exactly the same detail, and where he's trying to drive the country and his constituents in a certain direction, you're sort of driving them in another, and I find that just in the surface of it very interesting. When John Eikenberry gets here, we're going to embrace him, absorb him, and have him talk about the liberal leviathan or whatever. Obviously, he's having uh, trouble with the transport. I, I do want to open the floor to discussion, but I want to open. And it's really hard to fo follow, Daniel, because when you talk about the end of the world and nuclear catastrophe and all the bad stuff that can happen, it's kind of hard to talk about John Bolton or Law of the Seas. Maybe John Bolton. Um, but, w but the challenge, uh, one question I want to face to, to, to Peter and, and Charlie is, is to some degree, is your assessment right on the domestic dimensions, the manifestation of the domestic dimensions? I certainly see the partisanship. And I actually think you're approaching this not by looking at what we have out there, what are the ornaments we have in the liberal internationalist sphere, but really what are the political dimensions of sustainability. It's a fascinating uh, argument. But when you take a look at it and, and you say, well, we continue to pay UN dues. So America rejoined UNESCO. Um, the U.S. Senate prevented John Bolton from being confirmed, who, if anyone, is more the face of a kind of partisan, pugnacious nationalism, sort of a revived Jesse Helms, if you will. Um, it hasn't passed. It probably won't now. But there are about 65, 70 votes for the Law of the Seas Treaty. If Harry Reid uh, felt it were important to do, it's more of a Reid problem, I think, than, uh, than others. Even, even John McCain uh, was on record supporting Law of the Seas. Um, George Bush gave the World Bank Bob Zellick. Maybe he was just trying to rid himself of Bob Zellick, but nonetheless, it is interesting to send someone succeeding Wolfowitz, who I think is fairly competent. So in other words, I can find lots of things that say, you know, yeah, it's not the, 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 you know, the best situation, but it's, not also the, it's also not the worst. And so I'm trying to look for those binary tests to some degree to test in terms of the decision making that's happening today. And I can make a glasses half full argument that even in the worst of environments, I think, for liberal internationalism, you still see a consensus enough to come together to have pre prevented some of the worst swings. And uh, I'm sure Daniel would like to participate, but if I could get an answer to that briefly, you can sit here. We've got the camera going. Um, if you can speak into the mic, that would be great, and then I'd love to open up the floor. So what about UN dues, Bolton Law of the Seas, and Bob Zellick? Unless you want to address yeah. the end of the world challenge. Uh, I'll just uh, make a quick comment on that, and that is that uh, our, our argument is, is really one of uh, whether the United States is politically capable of a programmatic investment in a liberal international order. It is not, uh, it, is it is it the, the wrecking machine? Right. Is it going to go out and tear the system down? We've, to some extent, we have set the system back. But there are, that there, there are you know, quadrants in the political system that still support it. And, so, and you're right to point out that, that some of them are still, are still operative. Uh, but just a quick, a quick comment in response to Dan. You know, I, I think that, the, that your presentation was a perfect kind of mirror of, of where Peter and I are coming from in the sense that, you know, we're really down at ground level and you're way up here. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, what's going, what's the regional alignment uh, in the United States? 
Why is it that, and what are the implications of the fact that the Republican Party seems to have taken over the South? Our view about the Liberal International Compact is that it emerged despite the fact that it was an acceptance of the fact that there would be a strong central government and a level of, the spend, of defense spending that the Founding Fathers would never have contemplated. And it was feasible because on the ground, Southerners were benefiting from military spending because of the post, because of the World War II economic boom. So that, so we're, our levels of discourse are just, are just very disparate. Yeah, if I can respond to that. Um, I did respond to that very fundamentally, and I'd like to hear your response to my point, which is that the reason we had action that had a bipartisan character was because of the magnitude of the problems that we faced. And when the magnitude of the problems today, recently, has not been seen to be as great, we don't generate a consensus around it. And my argument is that there actually are problems on the horizon that we haven't fully grappled with or, or, or experienced and have been burned adequately, and that once that knowledge becomes more widespread, the solution-driven need to solve the problem will produce the consensus, or a sufficient consensus. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to come back on, on, on that point, because I think it's very useful. I mean, the formulation that you've advanced is that if there's a, a serious international crisis or problem out there that bipartisanship will follow, and um, I mean, when I was, as you were talking, I was thinking about that, and, and I mean, I've given this some thought before. There's just too many counterexamples. Um, I mean, one can go all the way back to the 1790s and, and um, you know, the, the uh, early 1800s and kind of an international crisis, the Napoleonic Wars, led to the formation of political parties. It was probably the most critical factor that encouraged not bipartisanship, but actually partisanship. I was thinking of the crisis of overproduction in the 1890s that was met not with bipartisanship, but with, with partisanship or the 1930s and the kind of the combination of uh, global depression and the rise of fascism which was certainly not met by bipartisanship. It may not have been as full throttle a partisanship as we see today, but nevertheless, certainly much more partisan than what one saw after World War II. And so I think that the thing is, is that the international crisis in and of itself or an international problem in and of itself doesn't guarantee bipartisanship. It really depends on contingent domestic Conditions. This is the argument that 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 we're advancing, and I think that is just too often left out of the story. Um, and so it becomes very easy to argue. Well, you know, there's this agenda, this international agenda, or this international problem that needs to be solved. And if you can, you know, define it properly, that people will follow, um, and or if you build it, they will come. Uh, and I think there's just too many counterfactuals that are that are out there. Um, anyway, I saw that Bill Galston, I think, is was in the is in the audience here and um, has has also written, uh, you know, fairly extensively on 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 partisanship. And so I, you may uh, and and bipartisanship, and you may have a, a a view on this as well. I think it's what you've done, Dan, is kind of put your finger on a critical issue, kind of analytic one, um, that just has huge implications. If you're right, you know, that leads you down one, one course of policy prescriptions, Thanks. but if it's wrong, you just have to pay so much attention to the actual political, the heavy political lifting. Thanks, Peter. Involved. I'm going to cut it off. Yeah. Uh, I want to open this floor. We're going to go back here to, um, to Paul Sham. Uh, in, in thinking about this later, though, if you, if you imagined a, a situation in which um, Oh, Barack Obama chose Chuck Hagel as running mate, and John McCain ran uh, Joe Lieberman with him. You know, I don't understand the Republican-Democratic divide because I don't. I see the divides within the parties. The John Bolton battle was never Republican-Democrat; it was a Republican civil war. And I think sometimes it's too easy to draw a line that looks like a partisan middle without really looking at the tectonics within both, which, which I think has to draw a real, you know, force a realignment at some point. Uh, Paul. 
I'm going to try to be brief because I'm going to repeat for the internet audience. Uh, very briefly, I am perplexed that none of you brought up the opposition to liberal internationalism, which is to say conservative ideology. And one of the reasons that you did not have it is there was no conservative ideology, certainly with regard to foreign policy, before Buckley et al. and this company started developing it later. Now you have thick, important conservative ideologies which vary, and it seems to me that is a very important reason. And uh, just one point, you, you, you said that you, uh, uh, this ridiculous debate over talking with our enemies. For a lot of the conservatives, this is fundamental to their beliefs. So I'd like you to discuss the rise of Thank conservative you. ideology. So the question is discussing the rise of conservative ideology as um, opposition to liberal internationalism. Uh, any of you? Charlie? I think it's a, it's a very, very important point, and it, and it does uh, illustrate the dynamic that, that we're talking about and, and our belief that these kinds of developments are much more a product of developments internal to the United States and, and not uh, driven by external events. And so we don't have a kind of demand-driven view of foreign policy that you know, if there's the threat out there, the response is going to, to, to be a, a, a rational one. And so you know, if, if I were to, if we were to have an extensive conversation in response to your question, I would start going back to the, to the civil rights movement. I would start talking about uh, the big changes that led to the realignment of the party system and that meant that you know, the, the most conservative part of the country, the South, moved to the Republican electoral column, and that the Rockefeller Republicans, who used to pull the party to the left, are gone. Uh, and one could make some similar arguments about the, about the Democratic Party on the other side of the equation. But it's those kinds of internal development, regional realignments, ideological movements, that leads, lead Peter and I quite worried about the center in American political life and therefore the sustainability of a liberal internationalist compact that relies upon the center for its political foundation. Are you advising Obama? Uh, I am one of the many that are... So do you tell Obama to stop trying to build a center or and, and just to try to annihilate his opposition? Or do you tell him, even though you've written about why it won't work, he needs, he needs to go, nonetheless, carry the flag for liberal internationalism. My own advice would be, do your best to reconstitute the center. It's worth trying. But realize that it's going to be an uphill battle and that you need a, a track to strategy, which is going out and doing some of the piecemeal alliance building across the partisan divide that we think is going to be very important to sustaining a consensus on an issue by issue basis. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll work with her. Yes. <clears throat> the aforementioned Bill Galston. Uh, <laughs> the, the aforementioned Bill Galston for those who are watching on tape. Uh, you know, as you know, Peter, Peter alluded uh, to a multi year bipartisan project on political polarization that Brookings and Hoover recently recently completed two volumes, both of which are called Red and Blue Nation Question uh, Mark. By the end of the study, I think we pretty much removed the question mark analytically. It's hard to disagree with the, the political proposition that you're advancing in, in your article, namely that the signs uh, of increased partisanship and party polarization are all around us. The center needs to be reconstructed because it has been eviscerated. But I want to pose the following question to you. I mean, we've heard a demand side argument and a supply side argument. But what they have in common is that they're both quite deterministic. And what that leaves out is <coughs> politics. What I want to suggest is the following. Uh, that it wasn't written in the stars that the League of Nations would fail. Woodrow Wilson 
manage the run-up to that debate in a way that was guaranteed to inflame opposition partisanship in the United States. Similarly, Franklin Roosevelt, who witnessed that very, very closely as the young assistant secretary of the Navy, self-consciously set out from the beginning of the Second World War to create the conditions for bipartisanship and international engagement after the Second World War. And if Roosevelt had been less politically skillful, despite the changes on the ground that you rightly point to, that project might very well have failed. So where's politics in all of this? Great question, and I wish everyone on the internet could, could have heard it. Uh, but fundamentally, where, where uh, is, are the political dimensions in these <coughs> somewhat deterministic presentations on the, the supply and demand side explanations for liberal internationalism? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great point, and, um, and in fact, in the piece, we, we do spend some time talking about what Roosevelt, what FDR brought to the table. It was a recognition and appreciation as an agent, really, of, of structure, recognizing what the structural possibilities were at the time. This is really his genius and then being able to seize it. And it involved finding ways to put parts of the country together that had never been together, as you well know. For example, you know, the big <coughs> urban centers of the United States and the manufacturing belt with kind of, you know, with the agrarian South. There had been a fleeting effort by Wilson, and it helps explain why Wilson was elected president, but it was Roosevelt that found a way to bring those together, and in fact, foreign policy played such a critical role in bringing those two parts of the country um, together. I think so that the, the, the point is, is, is very well taken. I think that what our feeling is, is that what has been going on is that there has been a tendency by leadership actually to simply play to the respective bases and not to think about how to reverse alliances, how to think about what the structural possibilities are for creating kind of cross-sectional alliances or bipartisan or cross-partisan alliances. There's a lot of hard kind of political work that went into, you know, that kind of coalition building. And so you're, I mean, the point is well taken that you're not going to get bipartisanship without active leadership, but you're also not going to get it if there are not structural possibilities out there, I think. So if it's deeply divided, if the party system is deeply, deeply divided along regional lines, it really limits the possibilities. And so you have to tailor, it seems to me, whatever the foreign policy, the set of foreign policy proposals or platform, you have to tailor it to those constraints. Roosevelt had more political possibilities, I think, than politicians do today. Too many questions, and we've got to have multiple responses in some cases, so I need to insist on brevity. Uh, Daniel? Um, <clears throat> just very briefly, I, I think that the article uh, is importantly uh, out of date, that uh, recent trends um, are uh, going in a very different direction than they were when that uh, piece went to bed. And it's striking that the two presidential nominees, McCain and Obama, are within their two parties advancing a post-partisan uh, agenda. That's very much part of the consensus that we have now. And another data point for this, everyone has seen these, these ads that are being run everywhere. You know, this is Nancy Pelosi and Newt Gingrich, you know, uh, we got um, right wing, left wing, sitting on the same sofa, basically saying Americans How often disagree. do you think they really do that? <laughs> well, but in terms of the issue, you see, my point is, as I said before, the issues create the coalitions. Not inevitably, but they create a significant structural demand for it. And this is a global warming issue that these people are coming together on. And as this issue raises in salience, we're going to get an entirely different configuration politically. Yes, sir. Victor. And then Bob. I'm going to please beg for brevity because I've got to repeat it. I see a long paper in front of you. So. Well, as mentioned previously, you know, it's easier to make uh, a long speech than a short 
We'll try. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Uh, I'm Victor Bassett, consultant in national uh, security policy. Uh, I think a critical point here is where the center of gravity in foreign policy lies in U.S. foreign <coughs> policy. Is it in the domestic field, in the foreign field, and where, where is it moving? And here, something that hasn't been brought up here is the basic fact that the United States is losing in relative power. So we have to look more towards abroad how to preserve our influence in foreign affairs. The simple fact, again, the fact is that we will lose in hard power to China, to Asia, eventually to India. That's, that's a given. So how do we rely on soft power to counterbalance that? And this brings us to this gentleman and, interna and uh, liberal internationalism. That is, it requires our thinking about the rest of the world and less attention to what is going on in the domestic field and to shut up the various conservative and, and, and other small elements of domestic fields that are screaming for this, that, or the other, and look for our survival in the long run. If John Eikenberry were walking in the room, he would love this question more than any other, because it would open the door to his uh, thesis about what's called the liberal leviathan, meaning that no matter what you think about American power and relative rise or fall, it nonetheless outstrips the rest of the world, and thus a grand bargain is needed in which America sort of maintains its position by negotiating the provision of public goods uh, internationally. And um, so that's what he would say, uh, I think. Uh, but but uh, uh, any quick responses to the question of where is the center of gravity in foreign policy? Where does it lie, domestic or international, uh, given uh, what appears to be the decline uh, in American uh, capabilities and, and position in the world? Also, which way yeah. is moving? The which way is it moving? Uh, just to make a, a quick comment, and this would play off of John, even though he's not here. Uh, and this, is, I think, is an, a very important uh, difference in this debate, and one that we all need to, to take a stake on. The the Eikenberry position uh, is that, you know, precisely because our power position is eroding, we need to to lock in a institutional order, a liberal in institutional order, which will be there when we no longer have the ability to underwrite it. Uh, and he believes that the liberal order that the United States has created, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dan, uh, is, a, is a good order that is in the interests of all. It's like behind the Rawlsy <coughs> veil, this is what uh, you would design. In other words, China will propagate our order. Yes. I don't buy that. Uh, I think that the liberal international order that was erected by the United States is very good for the United States. It was generally good for the world, but it was particularly good for us. It served our interests. And moving forward in the world, when China has a seat at the table and Russia has a seat at the table, they're going to want to change that order in ways that advantage them we're going to have to be ready to negotiate. So if we think that we've created this, you know, this structure that's good for everyone and we just need to let them in, I think we're going to be for a, uh, in for a rude awakening. You've just seen Charlie Kupchin, so some of his realist foibles. Uh, Bob <laughs> Dreyfus. I'm sorry, I've got to go, rather. Bob Dreyfus. Um, yeah, I want to come back to Steve's question about Obama. His an effort to build a bipartisan type foreign policy. Um, you said it would be an uphill battle. Um, but it seems like big parts of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are kind of looking for Joe DiMaggio again to come and you know bring us back to the pre-Bush world, whatever that was like. Maybe it's nostalgic or not, I don't know. But what what elements of Obama's policy would be an uphill battle? In other words, he's He's calling for an expansion of the Pentagon and of the Army and, uh, and creating an expeditionary force and strengthening special forces and doing all those kind of things that are 
terms of a hard power, and he's talking about diplomacy and creating, you know, better alliances in the UN and all of that. And, and that seems to be power and partnership. So which of these elements would it be hard for him if he gets, you know, a, a decent mandate? Would it be hard for him to? Uh, okay. So for the internet, what are the the bipart What are the uphill pieces, <coughs> uphill struggle? Uh, for an Obama bipartisan foreign <coughs> policy? I think that, o that Obama is a liberal internationalist. Uh, and I don't, I, I'm sort of less convinced than Peter that the Democrats are <coughs> decidedly shifting for partnership and uncomfortable with power. I, I think that's to some extent true with the party base, that the, that the activists are still in sort of a post-Vietnam hangover and, and uncomfortable with the assertive use of American power. I do not believe that the party elites or that Obama or that the people around Obama uh, feel that way. Uh, and so uh, I think if anybody has a chance of restoring a bipartisan consensus behind liberal internationalism, uh, he does. But uh, I, I think he's going to have his, his work cut out for him in the sense that the Republican Party is not of a single line. Uh, I mean, you can just look at, at John McCain and the people around him and see how deeply divided the party is, uh, uh, particularly, let's say, on, on the question of Russia, where on one day he's saying, kick Russia out of the G8, and then he gives a speech on arms control that could have been written by uh, a liberal Democrat. The Republican Party is deeply divided on this. On they trade, were written by different people. Right. I mean, you had Rick Burt. Uh, and and uh, Bob Kagan writing the same speech, uh, and when, you know Rick Byrd is a card-carrying liberal internationalist of the Daddy Bush era, uh, and then you've got these other guys who who you know, come from the neoconservative world. But let me challenge you just for a second: Isn't it easier? And I'll say to the internet folks watching this, I don't really believe what I'm about to say, but I listened to Barack Obama's speech at APAC the other day and was stunned by particularly a one line that ran right of President Bush and right of the incumbent Israeli government about Jerusalem. And so it went beyond cultivation of, you know, the normal 75% of the Democratic <coughs> Jewish vote that goes Democrat. Um, but in that, it, it made me question whether Democrats have a problem in the power part of the equation that do they carry a chip on their shoulder? Do they feel that they need a crisis or a tough problem to define their presidency so that they can look credible? Because when they talk peace, they talk negotiations, they talk institutions, they look like Neville Chamberlain appeasers, and that's one of the calculations. Does McCain have an easier job actually be, you know, building a, a, a bipartisan, if, if he wanted to, consensus? Because I get the sense that even though he sings about bombing Iran, talks about long-term wars, it's easier for him to walk that back to a different position. Tell me why that's incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, one thing that I would say uh, in response to this about Obama is I think that Obama is really wearing partnership on his sleeve. Um, in, um, you know, by, by making, by really stressing the need to negotiate with enemies. I mean, on the particular point about Jerusalem, I mean, he backed off. The, the campaign already has, been, you know, immediately backed off from the position. And somebody who was cynical might say, hey, look, you know, what he was doing was, you know, there was a tactical advantage to being, trying to have it both ways, to take a very strong position, to reassure the audience that he was dealing with, and then to have the campaign back off within 24 hours, actually six hours. So, but I want to go back to the point that was raised just a moment ago, which I think is really good, you know, that, you know, don't you see some power and partnership in kind of the Obama platform? I, I think you can make an argument that it's there in his case and that it's also there in the case of McCain, that both of them are trying, as Charlie said earlier, to, to appeal to the center. I mean, there's two points here. One is, is that as Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt said a long time ago, you know, in reference to Woodrow Wilson, you know, that it's a very, um, 
you know, it's a terrible thing, he said, to an aide to look over, when you're trying to lead, to look over your shoulder and see that nobody's following. And so, you know, one of the, the potential problems here is that they're out of step with the core partisan position of the party. But a second point, just quick, is that Obama's going to have to make a decision like every president does. If Obama ends up being the president, where are you going to invest your political capital? Are you going to invest it on the international side? Are you going to invest it on the domestic side? It seems to me that that is a prior question. That really comes before the question of, are you going to invest your political capital in trying to resurrect liberal internationalism? I'm not convinced of it. An Obama presidency, it seems to me, would focus very heavily Side. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, a question, or maybe two, uh, but I think they're quick. Um, just so I can hear the healthy internet here, I'm just going to hand okay. you the mic. Uh, if uh, we had had um, no butterfly ballot in a Gore presidency, or a Bradley presidency, or a McCain presidency, or a different factional outcome after 2001 in the Bush presidency, would we now be talking about the lock-in of liberal internationalism, of the realist international synthesis, or maybe even a liberal exceptionalist kind of neocon, liberal internationalist synthesis uh, as being the center of American politics, and if not, why not? Um, in other words, how much of this is conditioned upon a series of very contingent outcomes in the last six years? Um, I had another related question, but I won't ask it. Well, unfortunately, things didn't turn out that way. And uh, as someone pointed out in an earlier question, uh, those kinds of point-specific events matter. Uh, you know, Wilson's handling of the of Article Ten of the of the, of the League Covenant and his fight with Lodge, I mean, that altered history. If he had given in on that, then maybe the U.S. would not have turned isolationist. Who knows? The bottom line is that, you know, we've been living the last eight years of the Bush administration. It has been exceedingly polarizing. Uh, but our argument really goes back to well before Bush. It's about the 1990s. It is about an unraveling of the bipartisan center that occurred before Bush came into office. And so we see it more as a symptom than as a cause of this broader phenomenon that we're talking about. And so, uh, you know, it, let's just assume <coughs> if, if Gore uh, had been president, my own answer is that much of what we're talking about would still be relevant. It would have just taken much longer to play itself out. History got sped up. I should also add that there were other issues beyond who the leadership was as to what happened. There was the case, I, I, know, I know directly, that the uh, uh, Bush's biggest single priority in, in, in American politics was the passage of the pa tax cuts. And after they achieved their greatest gain, their popularity level was 51%. And Karl Rove called that our good as it gets number and, and went down. And then to some degree, I think that regardless of 9-11 and certainly not ascribing any planning, the administration moved from a stance where it had rejected the stridency that might have escalated on the April 2001 EP3 incident uh, and then began to essentially look at um, international incidents, in incidents by which it could define itself and define its behavior. So that, I mean, this was not an administration that was hungry for defining itself in this way. It's just the domestic political um, apathy for some of the domestic economic stuff when it drove Bush in, in an interesting, and I think in a different in a different direction, if you were to use the domestic root side of what you're doing. Uh, let me go right here, yes. Okay. Yeah, Ned Spanis from the IR. It seems to me that none of you uh, take into account what a radical departure this, the liberal internationalist model, as I would say, embodied by the concept of democracies, is from the FDR post-World War II model, what FDR envisioned, right. which was based upon national sovereignty, political sovereignty, and economic right. sovereignty, an alliance with the great powers, including Russia and China, right, and an outlawing of aggressive war. The concept of democracies is an elimination of economic sovereignty, the globalization of free trade, which is the old imperialism, just in a polite face. The concept of democracy abolishes national sovereignty, 
by saying that, it, it, you know, various things, two-thirds of democracy, so-called, can intervene, militarily intervene, bypassing the UN Security Council, right? Preventive war is just another form of aggressive war, and of key advisors to both campaigns adopt this policy. Yeah. This is, is, is really a radical overthrow of everything that FDR stood for, what he envisioned in, the, in that system, which was a system based upon national sovereignty. Now we have... Got it. Right? Yep, That's got it. Point. Thank you. So the question is uh, really a fascinating and important one about the, the, the concert of democracies and, and, and where it, it, it fits. This is, again, John Eikenberry, um, along with Anne-Marie Slaughter and Tony Lake and Todd Lindbergh and a, and a bipartisan group of folks involved with the Princeton Project on National Security helped launch this uh, notion of a concert of democracies. Um, and to some degree, I think an interesting split has happened among, between the presidential advisors about how they define this institution. There's slight branding differences, but, uh, but just in discussions with friends of mine like Todd Lindbergh and others, they don't see the different, Bob, you know, Bob Kagan, not a friend of mine, but Bob Kagan uh, certainly has um, had something to say. And John uh, Eikenberry, who's just walking in, might have something to say about the concert of democracies, because as I understand it, when I spoke to him the other day, he's taking a whack at the Republican uh, malfeasance uh, involved with how they redefine the concert. But let me ask Peter to jump on this. Uh, why don't you savage the concert of democracies, and we'll ask Daniel to uh, uh, support it, and John can have a few minutes to catch up. Guys, I know we're over, but I would love to give John Eikenberry a few minutes, too. I think it's valuable. Thank you for being here. I went to great uh, lengths to have the yeah. last word. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Peter? Well, just in, in one quick response. I mean, I think the point is well taken. You know, FDR believed in, in kind of um, great power management, kind of, um, you know, uh, he did the four policemen. He did not believe in the kind of, you know, uh, I mean, he did not favor kind of a league of democracies and clearly came down in favor of an institutional uh, uh, multilateral arrangement, uh, the UN. I mean, my own view about this idea for um, the, this idea about the League of Democracies is I actually find myself very close to Krauthammer on this and I'm surprised, uh, you know, but um, I think he's, he has this right in the sense that this is a Trojan horse, um, at least, you know, that it's one way to circumvent the United Nations. And so you agree with him about the Trojan horse. He it. wants it and you don't. I, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really problematic, but I don't, I think the, at the analytic level, he's put his finger on it. I don't know about from the Obama side that that's the agenda from the left, but I think, you know. Alder is. I know, it's, it's coming from both sides, but it doesn't mean that both sides have exactly the same agenda. In fact, John has just walked in, this is unfair, but since I know he's writing on exactly this subject right now, the, the question essentially was um, raising this question of the concert of democracies and how it, um, to some degree, Ed, Ed's comment was it does act like a Trojan horse to undermine uh, the institutions that allowed us to talk to rivals and allies and uh, it circumvents the more significant institutions of uh, liberal internationalism. Yeah, the Princeton Project uh, put forward the idea of a concert of democracies with the idea that it would be a coalition that would, in the first instance, be uh, involved in trying to reform the other institutions. And we made it very clear that the, you have to see the concert in the context of a larger effort at global governance reform. Uh, and so you do, as Peter said, need to be aware that the international order of the last 50, 60 years has been uh, or put together and ordered by really two logics. One, a great power logic that uh, symbolically has been anchored in the UN Security Council, uh, great power exceptionalism, and then a kind of sovereignty-based uh, uh, Westphalian order of uh, notion of order. Uh, during the Cold War, the, the Security Council was less the pivot for that, uh, that order that, that, than, than was the bipolar system. But th there was, at the same time, this other order uh, uh, built among the democracies, and it did a lot of work. And our idea is that you need to continue to work on that dimension as well, that democracy is one thing we know, and it's an old idea going back to Immanuel Kant, who really had the vision of a, of a uh, union, or a confederation at least, of of uh, democracies or republic, republican states, 
uh, and that that would have virtues uh, and security implications. Today, in the modern guys, what we, what we get out of it, we argue, is the ability to engage in much more complex and far-reaching forms of cooperation. And you look in the 21st century out into the, the decades uh, beyond this one, and you realize that all the problems that we have before us are going to require new innovative forms of cooperation that we can't even really uh, fully uh, envisage today, and that it's going to be democracies who are going to pioneer that, just as in Europe, uh, European democracies have pioneered a new kind of system to solve all sorts of problems and, and grasp new opportunities. So you need to have that option of available. I would say in this context today, I would not push forward with a, with a concert of democracies, that it has been hijacked and by, by some who have, the, who have the, the wrong agenda and want to use it for the wrong purposes. And in the, today's context, I wouldn't want to push it, but it's, it's out there and uh, it Remember, will... Remember, this is on the record. I think you just made news. I think you get on in front of the Wilson, uh, Wilson Center uh, I, I, newsletter. I think some people do. I'm not going to identify who they are. Some people would love to see it supplant the UN, and I think that is a dangerous idea. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, did you want to add any comments? No. Um, I, I know we're at the end. I also know some of us are freezing in this oddly hot day uh, in this <laughs> cold room. Um, but I do want to give John Eikenberry, you, you haven't heard the presentations. We've tried to do a job, I think a poor job, but none, nonetheless a job to try to describe uh, and, and share your views on the subject. But I'd love to give you a few minutes, just four or five minutes, uh, to respond and give us the big the big zingers uh, oh, which you are going to trounce. As I think you used the word decimate, uh, Peter and uh, oh, Charlie. Oh, dear. No, I, not at all. I mean, I, I think their paper and angle on, on the issue of whether liberal internationalism is an important one. They identify important issues. There clearly is a transition going on, some kind of shift. I think of it as the Buffalo Springfield issue. You know, something's happening. We are, what, what it is is not exactly clear. I mean, there is a kind of transition, and it, it's not clear whether, the, and, and something on the other side of this moment is going to, to uh, appear, and it, it will, I think in the end it will be another form of liberal internationalism. Uh, but we are in a period of crisis, I think, and transformation, and some of the old underpinnings of liberal internationalism are, are giving way, and, and yet, interestingly enough, new uh, forces and actors and rationales and imperatives and incentives are emerging that are, is, is propelling liberal internationalism forward in new and exciting ways. I want to make three points. First point, pull back, take a deep breath, look at the global system over the last uh, several hundred years. And I would argue, looking back over the 19th and 20th century, the most important uh, phenomenon of world politics has been the liberal ascendancy, that over those 200 years, liberal democracies have emerged, become the most powerful states. They've, over several different iterations of order building, tried different experiments in liberal order. Obviously, the most successful one has been after 1945 and then after the Cold War. But they have pioneered order uh, that has driven out uh, competitors, competitor, competitor logics, competitor great powers, wielding alternative ideologies. Uh, and then after World War II, the most uh, far-reaching transformation of world politics occurred. Old rivals in Europe bound themselves together, uh, pr pursuing and employing liberal strategies of security, binding themselves together. Frameworks were made to open the world economy, to reintegrate great to uh, Germany and Japan. The system of wealth uh, creation and power uh, uh, concentration won the Cold War. And American power in this framework, this liberal framework uh, uh, after World War II, made the United States a progressive force in world politics and a producer of order. Uh, and all these great successes have been uh, 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 appended to it, as I've just mentioned. And it's been a logic that liberal internationalism had, has had all of these interesting aspects. It's like a diamond. You can see different facets of it. And it, it's clustered together in ways. It's open trade. It's multilateral institutions. It's cooperative security. It's democratic uh, solidarity. And it's American hegemony. All of those have formed uh, to create this order. And I would just say that looking back, this liberal ascendancy has I don't think crested, but is still is still evolving and expanding and deepening. Uh, uh, there has been a, a democratic recession. That is to say, some of the ex 
uh, states that looked like they were moving towards uh, integrating into this order have, have backed away. But if you look at down a kind of bird's eye view of the international system, it's this liberal order that America is still at the center of, which is the dominant force, the OECD world. And you put non-democratic states that are sort of outside this order next to it, and they are dinky. Even China, uh, 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 measured in terms of the uh, aggregation of, 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 of GNP and complex forms of, of, of institutions for problem solving and cooperation. It's just the dominant force. And I think that if you're going to argue that the end of liberal internationalism has, is upon us, you're going to have to have a very, very, very powerful theory of how the world works to say that we are at an inflection point. And I don't think uh, Charlie and, and Peter have that theory. I think they're looking at the United States, they see things, I think they partially uh, and narrowly define liberal internationalism or, or focus more on, on use of force, which I don't think is at the heart of it, uh, but it, it is part of one of the facets, if you will. But so, so my first point is, I think you're going to have to have a pretty powerful theory to, tell, to, to, to try to convince us that the liberal ascendancy is somehow uh, uh, coming to a kind of crest. And, and again, I, I don't think it's true, and I don't think a theory is out there that suggests it's true. Uh, the second point is, and I'm sure that you've covered this and, and, and explored these issues of, of, of the internal American system, and, uh, and here I would just say that what's most striking about me is how, how weak are the arguments for a radical shift away from the kind of historic American, we'll call it deep engagement, which entails alliances, multilateral institutions, and uh, all forms of cooperation that have not just been surviving since 45, but are, are every year more treaties, more agreements, it, it, it continues to deepen even if the pace has gone down. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, I'm struck by, in the wake of even of the most controversial uh, American uh, internationalist, in, in this case unilateral use of force episode in post-war history, uh, what many people see as a great uh, or grand strategic failure has not triggered a kind of come home America in either political <coughs> party as the Vietnam War did. So my, so my point there is, and I'm sure you've explored this, is that I, I think that the domestic scene is much more complex, that there aren't um, uh, uh, Robert Tafts, there are more Vandenbergs and, uh, today, and the kind of mind shift about security interdependence and the way in which the United States has to it has to do things to secure the interests, has shifted the debate that will never take us back to that period. Final point, and this is really where I, whenever I read Charlie and Peter's work on this subject, I can't quite see the world that they're trying to map uh, in the out years, 2025, 2030. What would it look, what does their world look like if they are right about the Decline of liberal internationalism, either internationally uh, and/or domestically in America, and I don't, I can't, I, I, there's no picture that springs to mind. What is it? Because I think if you look out there, I would certainly put the bet down that in 2025, 2030, uh, the system that we now associate with liberal internationalism, described as liberal internationalism, will still be largely in place. NATO will be still doing its thing. The UN will be expanding, not contracting peacekeeping activities. Uh, the density of international regimes will be greater, not less. Rising states will be more inside this originally Western-oriented multilateral system. The China already is in the WTO and in the UN. So I see the rising states uh, becoming the new uh, advocates of liberal internationalism, seeing this as, as part of their structure to protect their interests as they grow, certainly China. And I would also see, finally, to wrap up, the U.S. I would bet in 2020 or 2025, the U.S. will still be actively trying to use the U.N. on sanctions issue. Foreign aid will be greater than it, than it is now. NATO will, will be a vehicle of American leadership. Uh, we will be pushing hard on NPT and uh, uh, IAEA uh, capabilities. And new institutional commitments will be there in, in East Asia, uh, global warming, uh, that we will, uh, new types of, of institutions, not all of them formal treaty based, but networks, which are already, in some sense, providing the kind of hidden uh, source of internationalism that, uh, that uh, is often under the radar screen. So I, that's where I, I see the future. And 
and it fits with what I think is the dominant set of theories to explain how we got to this point after 200 years. And so uh, that's that's where I would, alas, start the conversation. Unfortunately, it's going to be how I... Well, uh, well John, I want to thank you um, very much for bringing us there. I think we've had a very nice, uh, refreshing set of contrasting views about the state of liberal international order liberal internationalism, where we would take it. I mean, Daniel Dudney took it to uh, spectacular levels uh, to some degree uh, with his discussion of some, some very nihilistic views. I, I would only end, you know, I, uh, you know, <laughs> I have to do something with that down the road. But I, I, I want to, you know, I want to give uh, Charlie and, and, and Peter somewhat of a break because to some degree we try to present contrast. I did, and I tried to, you know, define them uh, more deeply than you folks really wanted me to, um, and thanks for letting me do that. But, but to some, I tell people, it's a bad metaphor, but still it's useful, that I own Google stock and I own Xerox stock. Xerox stock hasn't moved, with all due respect to anybody from Xerox watching, uh, for a very, very long time. It's a big company. It used to provide all sorts of great stuff. It, had, it captured the imagination of the world. It, it, it's it's uh, a machine, is a brand, one of the best known brands in the world. And its stock sits right at like $16 a share uh, forever and will ever be there. It, it, it is not good. Google, which, which in there is, is not nearly, does not have the asset base. Does not, nonetheless, it's the promise of what folks think they'll get out of it that determines a very high market valuation uh, for that. And I sometimes wonder whether the combination of the United States and the liberal international order, which I know John treats distinctly, to some degree distinctly, nonetheless are somewhat like Xerox today and, and that the promise, the diminishment, the, the, the look at what you can get out of it in the long run, unless China comes over and does a, you know, uh, an acquisition of the process and reshapes it and takes it in a different direction, you know, we, we, whether or not we're just sitting and deluding ourselves with a kind of, uh, uh, with some hubris about what this means with an inability, whereas most of the world is just passing us by, moving into different orders. Fareed Zakari and others have talked about this, Parag Khanna and, and whatnot. You're in a debate with some of them on the Washington Note. Whether or not um, we really need to come back and rethink uh, w whether or not what Peter and Charlie are describing is a Xerox situation having lost that momentum on many levels, both domestically to sustain the big vision, uh, and the big vision, at least in our current institutional arrangements and deals and social contracts, isn't possible. I'm not going to let you answer that because folks have been very kind. Uh, I, wanna, I do want to thank those on the uh, internet. I want to thank our staff, particularly Ron Tang, who's been managing the camera, and Ben Cantor, Andrew Leibovich, and Samir Lalwani. And if those of you who are interested, because it does touch on this, Bruce Stokes and another gentleman from the Pew uh, Global Attitude Survey will be here on Monday from noon to 2 to look at the release of the new Global uh, Attitude Survey for this next year, which I think will be important and also another dimension of this. So please give a uh, round of applause to Daniel Dean. Thank you for coming.